What a nice, rich voice. <laughs> I love that song. In fact, I'll probably be singing it all today now. <laughs> no? No, I can't. <laughs> well, I hope you're having a good week. Um, Marilyn sent me this. Marilyn is our roaring chef that gets up early and makes the hot food for the Bible study each week. So we appreciate you, Marilyn. But uh, who knows what the word paraprodokian means? Paraprodokian. Winston Churchill loved these. These are figures of speech in which the latter part of a sentence or phrase is unexpected and surprising. It's an interesting word. Here's a couple of them that I picked out that she sent me. Where there's a will, I want to be in it. The last thing I want to do is hurt you, but it's still on my list. Since light travels faster than sound, some people appear bright until you hear them speak. I didn't say it was your fault. I said I was blaming you. <laughs> I think. A clear conscience is a sign of a fuzzy memory. Money can't buy happiness, but it sure makes misery easier to live with. And then, I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not so sure. <laughs> I think that. And then last, we'll appreciate this. Tolbert, I'm supposed to respect my elders, but now it's getting harder and harder for me to find one. <laughs> So that's good. And we appreciate you, Jim, handling the system each week. Appreciate you. Well, if you take your uh, lesson outline, we're going to be in numbers for probably a couple of more weeks. And what we learned last week, we were introduced to Balaam, even though tempted by wealth. Balaam could not curse the children of Israel. The Abrahamic covenant is still in effect. Christ is prophesied to come from the line of Jacob, and Israel is to become a strong nation, conquering the godless, idolatrous nations that inhabit the promised land. Some, though, fall to the influence of the culture surrounding them. It is important for us to stick to what the Bible teaches and avoid following the crowd. I wrote another letter to the paper today. Uh, I read Scott Burns' column. I like Scott usually. Uh, but the headline is, Will Higher Taxes Make This a More Civil Nation? And so he went on to say, we don't pay enough taxes, income taxes. He talked about how half the country pays no income tax. So I wrote, uh, Mr. Burns, you forgot a few taxes. Property tax, sales tax, utility taxes. And I went on and on and listed all the taxes that we all pay. And I said, the worst tax is inflation. It's on everything. And we're seeing it across the board right now. I said, the Beatles wrote a song a while back called The Tax Man. And it went, if you drive a car, they'll tax the street. If you try to walk, they'll tax your feet. I said, the only way this nation becomes more civil is by adhering to biblical principles. So we'll see if they print that, I don't know. But it gets, it gets me happier. And I like to sing because I'm 
happy. So, a couple of scriptures we talked about last week. Revelation 2.14, Jesus Christ addressing the church at Pergamos uh, mentions Balaam. And he says, but I have a few things against you because you have people in your congregation that hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balaam, the king of Moab, the pagan king, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. Now, Balak, the Moabites, the Midianites worshiped Baal. Baal is a satanic figure all through scripture. In fact, some of the other names are Ashtaroth. Um, it's uh, interesting that uh, He's also referred to as Moloch. Moloch was the one that sacrificed children. It was the first Planned Parenthood because if your kids didn't behave, it was perfectly okay to sacrifice them. So that's where we are in the scriptures. If you turn to, and page two is we always pray for the nation, this is done every week in the scripture Donna pick. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Psalm 25, 14 and 15. And then page three. Pagan king Balak has commissioned the Gentile prophet, Baal is not a Jew, to come and curse the Israelite nation because he fears their size and strength. Balaam, while desiring his monetary reward, cannot curse them, but rather God speaks blessings through him. But Balak wants his reward, so he comes up with a scheme to seduce the Hebrew men with beautiful Moabite women and Midianite women. The Moabites and the Midianites were allies. They were very friendly. And the Moab was a descendant of Lot and his incestuous relationship with his daughter. Midian was a descendant of Abraham and Keturah. So these never started out right they became very involved in the pagan culture and they hated the Israelites, they feared them, and so they concoct this plan, which we're gonna to get to here. So you can either follow on the outline or turn to Numbers 20, chapter 25. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before the gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal god of Peor, and you hear unequally yoked, that's exactly what this was, and the Lord's anger burned against them. The Lord hates that kind of satanic worship. It's immoral. Uh, Baal was specifically invoked in, in sexual acts in their temples. And so it was a very, uh, I would say it was an abomination to the God of Israel. So the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of these people, the ones that joined up with Baal, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away. 
So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. And here is just a disgusting thing that always tells me the Bible is true. Then an Israelite man brought into the camp a Midianite woman, a prostitute, right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly. So he parades this girl in to the tabernacle. They were weeping at the entrance to the tent of the meeting, to the tabernacle. So Moses was just prostrate and sick and sad about the judgment that's coming upon the Israel's uh, people who have gone this route. When Phineas, now Phineas is the grandson of Aaron. He is Eleazar the priest's son. So he's Aaron's grandson. And he saw, he left the assembly, this Israelite brought this prostitute into the beginning part of the tabernacle to have sex with her. So Phineas took a spear in his hand and followed the Israelite into the tent. So he, he's got this spear. He follows them in and they're having intercourse and he drove the spear into both of them right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach he put it right through the Israelite back so hard it went through him and killed the woman too the plague against the Israelites was stopped but those who died in the plague those who had hooked up with the satanic worship, number 24,000. Think about that, 24,000. And the Lord said to Moses, Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites since he was zealous for my honor, righteous indignation, among them as I am, I didn't wipe them all out and put an end to them in my zeal. Therefore, tell him I am making my covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant, lasting priesthood. They're always going to be the line of priests because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. The name of the Israelite who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, son of Salu, the leader of the Simeonite community. So this is the head guy of the tribe of Simeon. And the name of the Midianite woman who was put to death was Cosby, not Bill Cosby, just Cosby, daughter of Zer, a tribal chief. So these were two top people. One of the Midianites, queen or princess, and the tribal leader of the Simeonites. Now, Lord tells Moses, and sometimes we think, you know, the Lord is just awfully vicious to order these things. But he knows that these people are wicked through and through and don't deserve to exist. He said to Moses, treat the Midianites as enemies and kill them. They treated you as enemies when they deceived you in the Peor incident that was a setup involving their sister Cosby the daughter of the Midianite leader, the woman who was killed when the plague came as a result of that incident. So God's setting the tone 
for the Israeli army that's going to take the promised land. This is 40 years after they left Egypt. And God says, let's have another census. Okay, they took the census when they came out of uh, Egypt. There were 600,000 fighting men, and that's what they want to count again. After the plague, the Lord said to Moses and Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, take a census of the whole Israelite community by families. You can see why this is called the Book of Numbers. They're, they're constantly numbering things. All those 20 years old or more who are able to serve in the army of Israel. So on the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho, Moses and Eleazar, the priest, spoke with them and said, Take a census of the men 20 years old or more as the Lord had commanded. Now, if you want to see the genealogy, I'm not going to read it over, but it's uh, verse 5 to verse 50. And the total number of the men of Israel was 601,730. So, in 40 years, they only lost 1,820 fighting men. They were constantly being replenished with new children. And the Lord said to Moses, The land is to be allotted to them as an inheritance based on the number of names. So it's breaking out the promised land in pieces to the biggest to the smallest families. To a larger group, give a larger inheritance, and to a smaller group is to receive a smaller inheritance according to the number listed. Be sure the land is distributed by lot. What each group inherits will be according to the names for its ancestral tribe. Each inheritance is to be distributed by lot among the larger and smaller groups. And then they're going to count the Levites. And you can see that genealogy in verses 58 to 61. Page 5. All the male Levites, a month old or more, was 23,000. So they actually gained a 1,000 because the Levites didn't fight. They, they didn't go to battle. So their numbers actually increased. And they were not counted along with the other Israelites because they're not going to get any inherited land. They're going to run the tabernacle and the temple. These are the ones counted by Moses and Eleazar the priest when they counted the Israelites on the plain of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. And I underline this next verse. Not one of them not one of the 600 plus thousand was among those counted by Moses and Aaron the priests when they counted the Israelites in the desert of Sinai. For the Lord had told those Israelites they would surely die in the wilderness. So over 40 years, that original 600,000 plus died in the wilderness. Everybody going into the promised land except Joshua and Caleb were new. They were, they were the people who God wanted to inherit this land. Now this next passage is interesting. It's chapter 27. Zelopehad's daughters. I love these biblical names. I, I they probably just call them Zell, Zell for short. I don't know. But uh, the daughters of Zelopehad, Son of Hepher, son of Gilead, son of Maker, the son of Manasseh. Manasseh was one of Joseph's sons. Belonged to the clan of Manasseh, son of Joseph. The names of the daughters were Mela, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tizza. A lot of Oz at the end of those names. They came forward and stood before Moses. This is the first women's rights movement in biblical history the leaders of the whole assembly at the tent of the meeting and they said listen our dad died in the wilderness he was not one of Korah's rebellion 
who banded together against the Lord, but he died for his own sin, which was grumbling, complaining, vetching, that kind of thing, and left no sons. Why should our father's name disappear from his clan? Because he had no son. Back then, only the males could inherit at that point. And so they said, give us some property. We want, we want to be in that will. And uh, Moses brought the case before the Lord. You know, Moses would really love to help people, and he would sought good advice from God. And the Lord said to him, what Zelophehad's daughters are saying is correct. That's the way it should be. You must certainly give them property as an inheritance among the father's relatives and give their father's inheritance. Say to the Israelites, so this becomes law now. If a man dies, leaves no son, give his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father had no brothers, give his inheritance to the nearest relative. This is kind of like uh, legal law today. Uh, that he may possess it. This is to have the force of law for the Israelites as the Lord commanded Moses. So let it be done. Now this next passage, starting in verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, go up to this mountain in the Abarim range and see the land I have given to the Israelites. So keep your place there, but turn to Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 to 4. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 to 4. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab to the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. So this is defining what God has just told Moses in Numbers. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead to Dan, and all naturally in the land of Ephraim, you could see everywhere from the top of this mountain, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah to the Mediterranean Sea. Must have been a clear day, because he could see for a long ways. And the south, in the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, to Zoar. And the Lord said to him, This is the land I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. God keeps his promises. This is a long time after that original promise was made. And I will give it to your seed, to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you aren't going in. You're not going in. Moses is going to die after he sees his land. He is about a little over 120 years old now. So he's at a ripe old age. When he went down to Egypt, he was 80, and then 40 years in the wilderness. So now he's, he's pushing 120. And he must have been in good shape to keep climbing these mountains. <laughs> I mean, it's probably not easy when you're 120. So the Lord said, go up to this mountain. That's Mount Nebo. And see the land I've given to the Israelites after you have seen it. You too will be gathered to your people as Aaron was. You're going to die. And I think it's encouraging that the scripture says gathered to your people. You know, a lot of folks in Royal Lambs have lost loved ones. And they'd really like to see them again. One of my prayers is that I will get to see my parents again in heaven. I want to let them know how much I love them. 
and how much I appreciate what they did for me. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, remember, they're all dying of thirst. And so God says to Moses, speak to the rock and the water will come. Well, Moses gets angry. He takes it on himself, starts hitting the rock with his rod. Both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before your eyes. In that instance, Moses took credit for that miracle. And God didn't like that. That's why I love those shows Donald's doing. All these people are giving credit for their redemptive stories to Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is tremendous. These were the waters of Barab Kadesh in the desert of Zim. Moses said to the Lord, so Moses understands, may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint somebody over this community. They need a leader. They are gonna be like lost sheep when you take me. And that's no brag, it's just fact. Appoint someone over this committee to go out and go in before them who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. All God's people need a shepherd. And who's the good shepherd? Jesus. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership. Leadership is a spiritual gift. And lay your hands on him and have him stand before Eliezer the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of all of your authority. You have authority, give it to him so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eliezer the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. That's how they would get their questions answered with that process that they used. It was kind of interesting in the high priest garments. It was kind of like a yes or no type of response. And at his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out at his command and they'll come in, they'll, they'll leave when they tell it, he tells them to, they'll fight when they have to. Joshua is a great leader. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and had him stand before Eliezer the priest, and the whole assembly, everybody's watching this happen, and he laid his hands on him and commissioned and blessed him. And the Lord instructed just as God told Moses how to do it. He's telling Joshua how to do it. So this is changing command. After 40 years, we're going to get a new leader in Joshua. So we'll open it up for any questions or comments. Yes. Two things remarkable in this lesson today. Uh, I guess I understood that none of the people that left Egypt went into Israel, but for men. Men, okay. So Moses was the only one, only man, that came out of Egypt, survived 40 years. But also remarkable to me is that he maintained his authority among these people that didn't know anything about Egypt well, or didn't have an experience of it. Yeah, the, the Jewish families really relate things to their kids. They tell the stories. And Moses is writing these five books during this 40 years. So they have things to study as well. Debbie. Um, what I learned today, Anton, is... Um, I really like to see this because I, I heard Pastor Robert Jeffers say once that God does not have grandchildren. <laughs> Meaning, you cannot be saved 
because your mother or your father saved. That's correct. And, and, but uh, on the other side, it, mean, it means you cannot blame your parents for the bad deeds that you do in life. Because, um, and especially I love that, because I claim that God, of the God of Israel is my God, even though he was not the God of my mother, maybe, but he's my God. And when you see that, um, when we read, when you taught us in the book of Leviticus, when we see that um, the sons of Aaron, Aaron were killed because they did something wrong, they were drunk in the sanctuary, now we see the grandson of Aaron being having a covenant of peace with God because God was pleased with what he did. That's exactly do. right. He, right? So, he found favor on his own. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it goes down to my decision, it's me. It's my decision. But on the other hand, it's like, the, he says, any of the Moabites cannot ever go into the assembly of God. But then you have Ruth. It's well, here, here's the interesting thing, and we'll study this next week, but God tells Moses to wipe out the Midianites. He doesn't say wipe out all the Moabites because he knows Ruth is going to come through that line that leads to the Messiah. Yeah. When we first started out in chapter 25, yes. it says that after the Israelite and the woman were killed, that it stopped the plague. What plague was going on at that the, time? The plague was God's judgment on those people who worshipped Baal. Okay, this, this, this event was like the crowning achievement of the judgment taking place. Because he had already told Moses, kill those leaders of those people that turned them and worshipped Baal. So it could have been either the disease or the sword, but God took 24,000 people. And it stopped when Phineas took this action. Boils or, or something, the plagues that they had. Yeah, I remember we had one earlier, um, Korah's Rebellion. They had a plague where 14,000 people died. So God's judgment can come in a few ways. And, you know, the neat thing is you're, you're either going to experience God's wrath or his grace. It is your choice. I saw something really interesting on a news program just recently. I don't know what we were watching, but, and it's, again, it's consequences. You know, New York City is now being overcome by rats. And it's because- And heroin of, addicts, they let them shoot up in the streets Well, now. I mean, but the rats are everywhere, and it's because of the sanitation and the way they run the city. So there was a doctor that was on, and they were saying that all you have to do is come in contact somehow or another with the urine of a rat, and people are getting sick and ending up in the hospital. That's so, how the bubonic plague uh, exactly. started I was thinking, in Europe. I was thinking of that when you were talking about plagues. And so whether or not it's um, the result, ultimately God is in control and he's sovereign, but the consequences yes. of being out of order in any way, shape, or form, there is a result, there is a net effect. And I think we live in a situation now, particularly with the younger generation, that does not believe that there is a consequence to anything. No, it's just all a victims. total <laughs> entitlement mentality. Yep. But what we're seeing is, is if, if things are out of order, God has such an order for everything. And when you move out of order, there is a net effect and a consequence. And there are consequences to electing leaders. What? Leaders. Yes. If you choose the wrong leader, like... <laughs> They have the worst mayor in America by far. And so that's the consequences that you see. I'll tell you who's number two. <laughs> I noticed when we were back in Deuteronomy, it said after Moses died that God buried him. Is that the only reference? And are we talking about literally burying uh, Moses? That's the way the Bible says it. Now, some people think, he was translated like Enoch and uh, Elijah. 
So well, there's, there's two. It there's, doesn't say that. It says he's actually buried. By yeah, God. yeah. I know. First Corinthians and Paul actually says that these 24,000 people died in one day because the children of Israel they were like invited to go to the sacrifice but this man brought the prostitute into the camp Yeah. and that's when in that day 24,000 died so there was yeah. yeah, could have been food poisoning from the sacrificial uh, devil worship <laughs> I'm a little confused. Oh, I, I thought the whole, for 40 years, the whole generation left Egypt would die before uh, Joshua takes over. And I thought it was women and men and also the priests. But it, did I understand today it's just the soldier or the man? It was the, the 600,000 fighting men. Some of the women survived. The children obviously survived because they grew up. So all the priests of the Levi, they did all that because they were not fighting men during the four years, unless they sinned somewhere. Well, they might have died of natural causes, but yes. Okay. Uh, and those two sons of Aaron, they were executed. <laughs> this is just a little tangent. Uh, did anybody remember seeing the movie Time Machine? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, one of my they, favorites. Yeah, okay, so they were the humans that were being eaten by the under the underneath dwellers you know, who worshiped Moloch, interestingly enough, and they they just kind of went along with everything. You know, they would be gathered up, the humans would be gathered up and taken down where they could be eaten. Like sheep to the slaughter. Yeah, yeah. and it just came to mind somehow it's Somehow it seems apropos of today. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of false prophets out there, and they're leading people astray. And a lot of the stuff that they're teaching people, you know, you're either a victim or you're an oppressor. You know, it's not your fault. But anyway, what we learned today, God hates immorality and satanic idolatry. The wages of this sin is death physically and spiritually. You know, they say a believer only dies once, lives twice. But these folks are going to die twice. going to live once, die twice. Phineas, grandson of Aaron's zeal for the Lord, rescues Israel from God's wrath. Spiritual leaders today can rescue us from that as well through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. People don't like to go, you know, you can tell, they don't like to hear about sin. They don't want to hear their faults. They don't want to hear that you have to repent or there's going to be wrath coming. They don't want to hear that. But Good spiritual leaders can rescue people through that message. And Joshua will succeed Moses as leader because he is blessed with the spirit of leadership. And boy, we need to pray for some godly leaders in this country. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Today. Father God, we come before your throne in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for his gift of eternal life and forgiveness. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you bless every person in this room today and those watching on YouTube. Lord, I ask that you would give them strength to resist evil, courage to preach the gospel, and Lord, I pray that you would supernaturally protect and guard their health. Bless them, Lord. Bless them in a special way. We thank you for your word, and we thank you that it's been recorded. And everything we need in life is contained in the scriptures. And I pray for this country that biblical principles would be 
put into effect by godly leaders. I hope it's not too late for our nation, Lord, because there's a remnant here that loves you very much. And I give you this prayer in the name above. Every name, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and in his name. Amen. We'll see you next week. I am a roaring lamb. I am a roaring lamb. And the time has come to take my...